Mr. McCoy back with part 26 of The Ear, The Eye and the Arm. I'm not surprised, Arm told Mother, who was lying on the sofa in the detective's office. He wasn't father material, too wishy-washy. Now, now, said I. Mother raised her woebegone eyes to look at Arm. I was so sure we had them. Now it's just like the first day. No, it isn't. Arm said firmly. The children have proven strong beyond our wildest expectations. They escaped from Dead Man's Flay. They got in and out of Rest Haven. They eluded the masks in the subway. According to Mrs. Horsepool Worthingham, after they recovered from the chicken pox, they practically ran her house. That evil woman, burst out Mother. Did you see the kitty coop? What was left of it? The point is, at every turn, the children have behaved with courage and intelligence. I'm sure they'll keep on doing it. Sakai stirred in a pouch, arm wore on his chest. She was replete with a sense of belonging. You never really liked the mellower, did you? Thought arm. Bad man, not you, she agreed loyally. Here stirred the cup of tea he was fixing for mother. He didn't want to give her the stuff they usually drank. Mr. Thirsty had sent over a packet of black dragon tea. I donated a gold rimmed cup inherited from his grandmother. Arm hoped the Roach family would postpone their happy hour until later. Hmm, this is good, Mother said as she drank. What would the she-elephant be doing in the starlight room, remarked I. Shh, warned Arm. Mother put down her cup. It's all right, I don't have the luxury of falling apart like the mellower. Anyone can go up and down the elevators of the mile-high McElwain, provided she doesn't make a nuisance of herself. The she-elephant probably stole the matchbook as a souvenir. Or got it from someone who ate there, Arm said. Yes, admitted Mother. I can't imagine her knowing anyone respectable. She has so-called respectable customers, Arm said. And as soon as he said it, he was sorry. Mother's mouth turned down and eyes filled with tears. I wouldn't mind so much if I knew the children were being taken care of. That's the only thing that matters to me, to know they're safe and happy. It's not a comfortable idea, but the she-elephant is in the business of selling children. The people who buy must want them very much. Arm didn't mention what he had heard about the masks. Mother cheered up a little then and even ate one of the cookies I placed temptingly by her cup. We'll have to check out the Mile High McElwain said. The problem is, where to begin? He thought about the trip to the starlight room. Sakai started screaming. Arm remembered too late how closely his mind was linked to hers. She must have seen the ground drop out from under his feet as the elevator shot up like a rocket. He tried to shift his thoughts, but Sakai's terror was too great. Her fear trapped him. Take her, he gasped. Mother plucked the baby from the pouch and carried her to the other end of the room. Ear splashed ice water in Arm's face. Ah, he breathed, shaking himself free of the hurtling elevator. Sakai settled down in Mother's arms. What happened? I said. It was like being in a room full of mirrors. I thought of something frightening. Sakai reflected it back to me, which made me more frightened, which upset her even more. I don't want to know how far that kind of a thing can go. For a moment, everyone was silent. Then Mother hesitantly said, I wouldn't mind keeping the baby for a while. It's an excellent idea, you know, until Tendai and the others are found, said Ear. Arm went to the window and looked out. Evening was falling, and the beggars were returning to the cow's guts. They were building a cook fire, and a legless man who propelled himself on a little cart was ferrying vegetables to a large stew pot. A pair of blind children peeled potatoes and sang lustily to the gathering people. It wasn't fair. Even the beggars had children. Even Mr. Thirsty went home to three adoring daughters who probably didn't know what Daddy did for a living. Ear and I could look forward to finding wives who would accept their unusual looks and abilities. Only he could not fall in love. Sakai told him that if he and another person got their minds locked into a frightening thought, and who does not have one now and then, uh, they would mirror it back and forth until they died or went insane. I'd like you to have her, he forced himself to say. Only you mustn't let that slimy mellower near her. Now, now, said I. There's no chance of that. He locked himself away when his mother was taken to Wawa prison. 
Mother wrapped Sakai in a blanket and thanked everyone for tea. As she climbed into the limo, she said, Tomorrow is Tendai's birthday. I wonder if he'll be able to celebrate it. I'm wondering that too. What do you think? Share with your fellow listener. Arm curled up on the sofa with the blanket pulled over his head. He heard eye and ear tiptoe out the door. They were probably going to eat at one of the soup kitchens that plied their wares and the cow's guts. Leaving me all alone, he thought bitterly. They'll talk to the waitresses and tell jokes uh, about me. I hope they have indigestion. Grumbling and fussing about, much as Sakai was doing in Kuda's old crib at that moment, Arm fell asleep. He was walking along a forest path. Arm often dreamed of the countryside around Hoang, where he grew up, but this place was different. The forest was much wider than anything he had ever seen, and it felt old. The trees towered far above his head. They were dotted with woody fungi as big as dinner plates and parasitic orchids. Throughout the canopy flitted night apes that melted into the shadows when he tried to look at them. Arm realized that no axe had ever been laid to these wild trees. Therefore, it was a sacred grove. The brooding spirit of the trees surrounded him like the coils of an electric dynamo. Even the air seemed to flow with power. The place was aware of him. From the shadows of the canopy to the rustle of Matabel ants in the dry grass, the whole grove vibrated with watchful attention. Arm remembered stories his mother had told him about a giant serpent that inhabited such places. He never saw it. All you detected was a springing shadow as the thing uncoiled to sink its fangs into the back of your neck. Arm whirled around. The night apes froze in the shadows. Flicker, flicker, rustle, rustle. Always just out of sight. Enter a strange part of the forest with praise, his mother had told him. You don't want to anger something you can't see. What beautiful trees, said Arm as he jumped. What was that large shape behind those bushes? The grass is so thick the kudu must go to sleep with round bellies every night. And so do the lions, he thought. Arm continued to praise the sacred grove and presently he became aware that he was not alone. He turned and cried out. A man was on the path. He was very tall. He wore a knee-length bark cloth with a zigzag pattern. His legs were ringed with gold anklets, and around his neck he wore a large, almost luminous nodoro. But what most got Arm's attention were the weapons. The man had a short sword at his waist, an ancient but efficient axe slung over his shoulder, a bow with a quiver of arrows next to the axe, a club covered with a filigree of copper wire, a pouch of darts that might or might not be tipped with poison, and the most businesslike spear ever seen. It was clearly someone who's used to unfriendly neighbors. Arm stood hypnotized as the person approached, moving with an easy hunter's gait. His mouth was set in a grim line and his eyes were steady. Lion's eyes. I wouldn't give a bent pin for your chance of survival if we were alone in the jungle path, he said. It was the man in the general's book, Mananapa founder of the Shana Empire. Arm sank to his knees. He understood in whose presence he really was. The Mahandro spirit of the land had chosen to show himself in the shape of the ancient king. Great chief, Arm whispered. Nawakako, the spirit said in a deep commanding voice, one whose reach is great. What do you want of me, Lord? Our people are in danger. Alien spirits invade. They come, hiding their true nature, but their purpose is to eat us. Arm's mouth went dry. He didn't know what to say. They seek to enslave our children and make them messengers of their will. You must prevent this. Me? How? Go to the highest place. Look down and you will see them. The spirit took off the Nidoro and placed it around Arm's neck. It felt as though live snakes were writhing all over his skin. It was unbearable. Arm reached up to tear off the necklace, and the sensation vanished. 
he stared at the Nahandro, unable to speak. Come the worst, we must perish together, it said. And then the whole sacred grove came apart. Leaves swirled, trees snapped, and night apes fled the cries with cries of woe. The forest broke open with a great crack, and arm fell into the darkness, until, shaken awake by ear, he felt for the Nodoro, but it was gone. Some nightmare, I said. I could hear you on the street. That's what comes of sleeping on an empty stomach, said Ear, setting down a selection of takeout. Garlic soup, curried prawns, avocado salad. If these don't give you nice dreams, I don't know what will. But Arm didn't want to eat. He paced up and down as he described his vision to the others. He was in a fever to go somewhere and do something. The Mahandro spoke to me, me, a nobody from the cow's guts. We always knew you had talent, said I. Lots of people are contacted by family spirits, but only two or three in each generation can speak to the Mahandro. He told me the country was being invaded by alien spirits who hid their true nature. Sounds like they're wearing masks. He helped himself to garlic soup and passed the ladle to I. Arms stopped pacing and stared at his friend. Ear, you're a genius. He was talking about the masks. So where do you think this conversation's going to go at this point? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. I'm McCoy back. I'm still here in spirit anyway. You're about to have the opportunity to continue writing, and as you do, remember you're telling the story from the inside of the story. You're thinking, where exactly am I? Do the details ring true? People who read your narrative can tell whether or not what you're describing really is what happened. So make sure you are describing it in a way where the details ring true. Be Detailed. You're not going to the airport or going to the USS Enterprise. You are first unbuckling your seatbelt or you're first stepping into the transporter room and you're having Scotty beam you down to a planet. Which reminds me, I'm about to beam down to my planet as well. I am in a, an important meeting right now, but I will return soon. So keep the focus. Do phenomenal things. I have talent too, you know ear licked curry sauce off his fingers. Arm continued his restless progress around the office. The masks were the first and most destructive gang, and they set the pattern for the rest. When the general restored order, the masks survived. They're not like the others. They don't really care about money. Terror is what they feed on. Arm struggled to form his idea. They're like an invading army. He went to the window and watched the beggars. They had finished their meal. They sat by the fire and listened to a pickpocket tell a story. Even from the office, Arm could see their dreamy, contented expressions. Across the street, Mr. Thirsty stood in this doorway in a white bartender's apron. He seemed to be enjoying the evening breeze. And Arm understood that when you had 10 million people jammed together in a city, you always had a few troublemakers. Some were violent like the she-elephant, and some were dishonest like Mrs. Horsepool Worthingham. Some were weak like the mellower, and quite a lot were simply greedy like Mr. Thirsty. You also had good people. The good and bad bubbled around like vegetables in a huge stew pot. General Masika scooped out the bad vegetables when he found them, but he didn't attempt to get them all. Only Mawari had the wisdom to do that. Mr. Thirsty's head turned as a bottle smashed through his window. He signaled to a man built like a hot water heater. The man dragged the bottle thrower to a parking lot to discuss his antisocial behavior. The bartender's brand of trouble felt normal. The masks didn't. They were the key. The masks were a form of spirit pollution spreading poison from top to bottom in the country. They were trying to kill the Mahandro, the spirit of the land, and then the soul of Zimbabwe would be dead. I was told to go to the highest place, Arm said, turning over the matchbook from the she-elephant's pocket. Unless I'm very much mistaken, that means the mild high blade. So what do you think's coming now? Share your prediction. 
And now a few moments more of the ear, the eye, and the arm. I fainted again when they went up the elevator. Arm felt queasy from his friend's fear. He and Ear dragged their comrade to a couch outside the starlight room. Down the hall, they saw an immense nail-studded door and five villainous-looking guards with weapons. Those aren't Nirvana guns, whispered Ear. Arm studied them carefully. They're called soul stealers. I've seen pictures and books. People say it's like getting hit by lightning. They're also illegal. When I woke up, they helped him into the restaurant for tea. Look at these prices, cried I, who seemed ready to faint again, but the maitre d' insisted on serving them for free. Any friend of the general is a friend of mine, said the round little man. Who are the apes down the hall? Arm asked. Them, the maitre d' pursed his lips, God wants. May Mawari protect us from such neighbors. Our business has fallen by half since they moved in. They're rude and insulting and stingy, added the passing waiter. Never leave tips. If they didn't have diplomatic immunity, I'd have them arrested as thieves. They are they take silverware, glasses even. Mayor Day quivered all over with anger. My wallet. I saw one of them slip it into his pocket. But do you think I could do anything? Once they're inside the embassy, it's God one in territory. The police are helpless. If that's how they behave as guests, I'd hate to see them at home. Interesting, said Arm. He carefully noted the position of the Godwan embassy before sitting by the panoramic window that made the starlight room famous. The sky was clear except for a few clouds that now and then drifted below the window. Arm could see all the way to the edge of Harar, where city lights gave way to farmland. Streams of traffic moved on the airways between tall buildings. A dinner party arrived on the elevator and was placed at tables not far away. The men were dressed in expensive dashikus, and the women wore long classical Ethiopian gowns. Arm felt a ripple of lazy good humor from the dinner party, a surge of greed from the waiters as they sized up the clothes, and something else. It wasn't an emotion, but the advance of it. To Arm, the world was a seething ocean of human desires that he tried to block out. This was a hole in the ocean. Intrigued, he turned his attention to it. It pulled at him. Come inside, it said. It's peaceful here. No more decisions, no more struggles. Arm felt his mind drifting toward the opening. How wonderful it would be to rest. No, said a voice inside him. It's not a hole, but a mouth. Arm jerked back so abruptly he knocked over a pitcher of water on the table. It splashed over the carpet, making the woman at the next table squeal. A waiter hurried over at once to sponge off their gowns. What's wrong? said Ear. I stood up at the table he was occupying, far from the window. I don't know, I never felt anything like it before, but it was coming from there. Arm pointed at the Godwana embassy. After apologizing to the people at the table, he went back to gazing out the window. This was the highest point in the city. All he could do was wait. Nagarofu, if you're going to keep acting like a fool, I'll have to find someone else to possess, said the voice inside. Mahandro? Arm said, aghast. Of course. Why else did I give you my Nadoro? Sometimes I think the intelligence of people gets less with every generation. I'm sorry, said Arm. The Mile High McElwain has a roof. Go look there. Yes, sir, Arm murmured unhappily. What did it say? asked Ear, but Arm was already on his way to find the Mater D. And we'll find out what happens next as the Ear, the Eye, and the Arm continues.